Okay. I'm going to start with Australopithecus onamensis. This species, the first fossils of it were actually discovered in the 1960s um, when a scientist named Brian Patterson began working in uh, the southwestern area of the Lake Turkana Basin in Kenya. Um, he found a piece of an elbow, uh, a distal humerus, that they looked at and said, this is hominin, and knew basically nothing else about it. Another fossil from this area, from a place called Lothagam, is a part of a jawbone with one tooth in it. And that probably also represents the species onamensis. Everyone knew, when I was a student, that these were probably the earliest hominins. But nobody knew enough about them to know that they should be called something different, or that they fall into a different place. Today, uh, we benefit from the fieldwork done by Meve Leakey and her collaborators during the early 1990s that recovered fossils from Kanapoi on the west side of Lake Turkana, and also Alia Bay on the northeastern side of Lake Turkana. And those fossils represent many individuals that they recognized as different from later hominins. Um, this is the type specimen of this species. Uh, excuse me, it's not the type, I think. I think the type is the mandible. Um, this maxilla and this mandible represent two different individuals, but they're very comparable to each other. They have uh, teeth that are aligned in two rows that are parallel to each other. They have a very strong degree of projection of the front of the face. You can see on this jawbone, if you look from the side at the way that the jawbone is sl sloping forward to reach the teeth, it has a very, very long slope. It's like really sloping that way. And the maxilla is similar. It's really sloping a lot. These are more similar to chimpanzees and bonobos and other apes in that specific framework. Um, where they're different from those other apes is that the canine teeth are smaller than other apes. And the rows of teeth, these molar teeth, are bigger and they have thicker enamel. These are the characteristic changes with which we recognize all early hominins. Early hominins have bigger teeth than other great apes of our size, and they have thicker molar enamel, and they have smaller canine teeth. Now, for each of these species, I'm going to do something cruel. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to show you all the slides I show to my graduate students about these species. This is more than you need to know. However, the reason why I'm doing it is not for anyone to learn any details about these species from the fossils, but for you to see that there are many fossils. And for me, as a professor in a field where it's very common that even students who are you know, working toward their PhD, they maybe don't look at all the fossils. They don't know how many there are. I just want to reinforce that there's a lot of evidence. But you will also see as I do this that much of that evidence is teeth and jaw bones and some pieces of skulls. And it is frustrating because you're going to look at this and you're going to be like, what do we know about the rest of the body? And I will show you the fossils that are of the rest of the body, and you will see that there are not very many. And I'll tell you what we can know about it, but it is buzzing through these. The one impression I want you to take away from it is where in the body the evidence is represented and what is left out. Because the one thing that is useful in looking at all the fossils is recognizing the parts that aren't there. OK, so here's this jawbone. Here's a side profile of the onamensis jawbones at the top compared to Australopithecus afarensis at the bottom. It's a contrast between these two species. They live in basically the same places. We're going to see afarensis. It also lives in Kenya and Tanzania, and uh, Kenya and Ethiopia, and adds Tanzania. Um, they live in the same places. There's some differences in our evidence about what they eat, and I might talk about that briefly tomorrow. Um, but their anatomy kind of is similar in a lot of ways, except in these aspects. The shape of the jaw and its degree of prognathism, the size of the molar teeth, which in afarensis is bigger, and uh, the orientation of the premolar teeth. 
Okay, so here we've got profiles. Okay, let's buzz through some fossils. I'm just going to show you. Every fossil that I'm going to show you is onamensis, unless I tell you otherwise. Okay, so here's just to show you, it's not just one jaw. There's several jaws. There's lots of pieces and parts. Lots of evidence of this species. Here's some more. These are all from the Turkana Basin, these fossils. Mostly the KNM KPs, these are all from Kanapoi, which is at the southwestern corner of Lake Turkana. Yeah, Bernardo. Yeah, please. What could you tell uh, would be the initial peak in the words of Philip Salaya of the Australopithecines? Because I think that. Yeah. What starts the Australopithecines? What gets them going? You know what? Let me just. And this is an amensis. This is on amensis. Yeah. So let me. I'm just going to go through all the teeth fast. Look at them. They're beautiful teeth. Look at these. They're so cool. Oh, it's a temporal bone. Ooh, a temporal bone <laughs> to get to this slide. Okay. So what starts this species on its way? This is the first species that we know of, of Australopithecus. Australopithecus is different from earlier hominins and different from every other kind of living primate in one important way. It walked bipedally, habitually, in the way that we do. So it was the first species we know of that was committed as a biped. We know this because of its knee. The knee joint that's represented here in the center of this image by a tibia, and I have that tibia next. Um, so I've got a slide that shows you all the views of it. But I'll go back to this one because this one shows you the difference between this onamensis tibia and a chimpanzee tibia, which is on the right of the image. The difference is very clear. In a human tibia, the tibia has these two condyles that the femur sits on. And in humans, they're both concave. They're both holding the femoral condyles. They're keeping them there secure. In a chimpanzee, the one that's medial is convex. And this is so that the, some rotation can happen at the knee joint. It's because chimpanzee knees are being used in a different orientation than humans are. That difference is super recognizable. We see it in this femur. The humerus is actually very similar with the chimpanzee humerus. This species is still climbing in an ape-like way. And I would say that not only on the basis of these fossils, which are not you know, amazing, um, but on the basis of every other species of Australopithecus that, to which these are similar. Australopithecus is a species, uh, as a genus, and, and onamensis, the first species of them, that can walk on the ground bipedally, much more easily than they can do anything else. That sets them apart from other species of primates. It is a big problem in human origins to try to understand why this was valuable. Today, everyone walks, and so we don't think about it so much. But the fact is that humans are slow. We do not move as quickly as quadrupedal primates that are our close relatives. If you're in a race with a chimpanzee, you lose. And if a chimpanzee is in a race with a leopard, the chimpanzee might win. We will not. And so we know that being a biped has disadvantages. It has some advantages. It sets us up higher so that we can see things around us more clearly. Um, it is a little bit energetically efficient. Um, if we're going to be walking bipedally, we're going to use less energy than we would if we were not well adapted to it. It gives us a different posture when we're climbing in trees. Earlier possible hominins, species like Ardipithecus, have some changes to their pelvis and some changes to their hind limb and their, and their foot that make us think that they were better adapted to being upright, but they still retain very long arms, fingers that are very long like chimpanzee fingers, opposable big toes, right? They, they retain many, many features that are not very good for walking efficiently on the ground in a bipedal way. 
whatever it was that caused Australopithecus to evolve, it must have overcome the disadvantages of being a biped. We're not sure what it was or whether there were many different factors. It is possible that it was climate change that was changing the ecology and creating more opportunities in spaces where the distance between trees was large and where being able to see and interact in an sort of a more visible way was protective or valuable. It may be that social interactions and just alarming and watching out for other individuals was more important than being able to run away. And so that interaction changed. It may be that the energetics were just different. Chimpanzees who live in savanna habitats today, and some chimpanzee populations in Senegal, in, uh, in Republic of Congo, and in Tanzania, are in savanna habitats. They're living in places where grassy resources are available, where trees are further between. These chimpanzees are often under heat, under heat stress. It's not so easy for them to live there. They also rely really heavily on resources fruits and other food resources that come only from trees. They're not relying on grasses in those habitats. Early hominins, our onamensis was relying a little bit on grasses, but looked very chimpanzee-like in its ratio of stable isotopes. Every other species of Australopithecus, with one exception, begins to rely more and more on grass resources. So whatever started them on the path of being bipeds, by 3.6 million years ago, 3.7 million years ago, they began to take advantage of it by using open habitat more, by using resources from those habitats more. Okay, so we've got the tibiae, we've got some finger bones, we've got this distal humerus, we have a beautiful radius, and this radius is so long, it's almost as long as my radius in a hominin where the tibia is probably this long, right? So this is a, a species that has still a lot of reliance on climbing. Um, it also occurs in other places besides the Turkana Basin. And so I want to show you in the middle Awash region of Ethiopia, um, there is a site, there's a couple of sites that have fairly you know, substantial evidence of onamensis being present. Um, you see here, um, this site, ASI is, it's Asa, Asa, Asa Isi, Asa Isi, yeah, thank you. Um, Aramis also, which is really well known for earlier uh, Ardipithecus fossils, but, um, but also has onamensis fossils from a slightly later time period. These fossils, in the range of 4.1, to about 3.7 million years, all of the onamensis fossils. Okay, here's some teeth. And this is another jaw. And then we have this. Um, this was discovered uh, in 2018 by Johannes Haile Selassie and his field team working in the Waranso Meal field region of Ethiopia. I'll talk a bit about sites. Um, and I actually haven't chosen an Ethiopian site. The principles of them are very similar to Olduvai Gorge, which I'll talk about. Um, but the, the thing that is helpful to keep in mind with, with sites is that East African sites are enormous. They are, the investigation of field sites is based on regions where you're doing survey and you're walking long distances looking for fossil outcrops, looking for places where fossils are eroding from deposits and stone tools in later time periods. So when I talk about a field region, um, the map that I just showed you of uh, the middle Awash is a valuable one, right? Because you've got a scale. There's a five kilometer bar, right? This entire site is what, it's probably three or four times the size of the Valley of Mexico, right? It's, it's an enormous area. And it's an area with, with lots of survey happening. Okay, so um, this fossil 
found at uh, a part of the Waranso Meal site that's known as Mirodora. You see it's discovered just like this, and, um, and it's, it's a wonderful fossil. Until two or three years ago, none of us knew what the skull of an onomensis was going to look like. This is the skull of an onomensis. In dental terms, the maxilla is similar to the other maxillae that have been identified as part of this species. Um, in terms of brain size, it's a little bit smaller than most later hominins. Um, it's about 360, 380 cubic centimeters. Slightly earlier, in southern Ethiopia, and actually this is also the middle Awash below Tali, there is another species that is present. That species is called today Australopithecus afarensis. So Onomensis is the earliest known species of, of Australopithecus. Afarensis emerges just before the last Onomensis have gone. Um, here's a frontal bone from this site below Tali. And let me show you, Afarensis, which is second here in the pink from the top, is a species that existed for a long time. The earliest fossils, 3.9 million years. The latest fossils, around 3 million years ago. So this species adapted and evolved for a long time. We have a very large fossil record of this species. We have hundreds of fossils of Afarensis. Those fossils represent most of the skeleton. Of course, we have many more individuals where we have their jaws and teeth than we have anything else, but we have a lot of individuals where we have other parts of the skeleton. We have every age represented, from infants that are very, very young to old adults. So that gives us some knowledge of the ontogeny of this species. This is a child's uh, mandible from, uh, from Lytoli. Here's this from the side. Um, Lytoli is in Tanzania. And the earliest large fossil sample of Afarensis is from Tanzania. The Lytoli site generated what was made the type specimen of Afarensis. This fossil, Lytoli hominin 4, LH4. Um, Many people know this story, I will briefly say. In the 1970s, when a primarily American team, but also French team, working in, in Ethiopia at the place called Hadar, was finding many, many fossils, Mary Leakey was working at Lytoli and also finding some fossils, and also the famous footprints. And Tim White, who was involved with working with Mary Leakey, and also Donald Johansson, who was working at Hadar, they compared these fossils with each other, and they decided that they likely represented one thing. And that was very groundbreaking, because the identification of the same new species from two places, that had never been done before. They named the species Australopithecus afarensis, and that's after the Afar Triangle in Ethiopia, where Afarensis, the Hadar fossils that were found, but they made the type specimen, this one, from Lytoli, LH4. Many of you know this story. Mary Leakey was furious. They had not consulted her, and, and she insisted that her name be removed from the paper. She did not think that this was right. And so, um, and so today, we have the species. This has gone through many taxonomic ups and downs. You don't need to know the details of these. But I will say that if you discover in the future that Afarensis suddenly is called something else, it's because there's this sort of long history of different fossils being named different things, and um, Afarensis was not the first name for them. OK. Afarensis compared to Onomensis. Afarensis has a wider jawbone that has bigger molars that um, are diverging in rows from each other. It has a more vertically oriented mandibular symphysis, and it has somewhat smaller canine teeth, and it has premolars that have begun to expand to be more molar-sized. And especially in the jawbone, the third premolars, in Afarensis and in most other kinds of great apes, they have one big point. And that big point articulates, it occludes with the canine tooth on the top, and they cut against each other. This is called honing. It's a cutting surface. 
In afarensis, this has gone away. They begin to have premolars that are being used for grinding and chewing, um, not for cutting against the, pre, uh, against the canines. So Lytoli fossils, an important part of what we know about afarensis, and the footprints are an important part about what we know about its behavior. The footprints from Lytoli, they show an upright bipedal with a very human-like foot species. There are many footprint trails from this site. Some of them have been discovered more recently, published even within the last few years, and there's some remarkable footprint sites. The footprints show some aspects of foot morphology that are very much like ours. The big toe that is aligned with the other toes. The, you can see the, the way that this foot, this footprint looks like there's an arch right here in it. They're functionally, they're operating like our feet are. Um, but also, there are footprints that don't seem to fit this pattern. Uh, my friend Jerry De Silva, who's done an analysis of some of these footprints, thinks that maybe there's another species there that isn't walking the same way. There are a few fossils um, from other sites, including from Ethiopia, from, uh, from Johannes' field site, we're on some meal, that have uh, feet that look a little different. It's possible that there were lineages that are surviving at the same time as Afarensis, whose fossils we have not recognized. So I keep that in mind. This fossil is around 3.4 million years old, and it comes from Chad. And this one, I'll show you here with a circle, is the one that is not from the East African Rift or from South Africa. This fossil comes from the middle of Chad. It's not alone. There's a couple of fossils from this. And um, mostly there's, there's a couple of isolated teeth, this jawbone, and another partial jawbone. And um, where they were found uh, by Michel Brunet and his team of Chad and, and French scientists, they found these in 1994. They judged that there's a couple of differences from the Hadar fossils that were known at that time. Uh, the third premolar has three roots, and the mandibular symphysis is a little different. They said, we call it Australopithecus baro -Ghazali. So there is a species, Australopithecus baro -Ghazali. Many scientists think that this is going to be an afarensis that is somewhat different, and it probably is. But it's a reminder that when we find fossils from other parts of Africa, we maybe shouldn't expect that they will be exactly like the same species somewhere else. They will exhibit some variation. Other afarensis sites in Ethiopia. Maka, which is in the middle Awash region, has some really valuable fossils. This is a comparison of the Maka humerus, uh, the VP1-3 humerus, with Lucy's humerus on the left. Here's a femur from Maka. It's showing many of the characteristic features of proximal femora of hominins, the way that the weight is distributed across the femoral neck, for example. Here's a mandible. It's a beautiful mandible, actually. It's one of the best, for sure, in afarensis. Here it is compared to Lucy's mandible. Now we come to 3.4, 3.5 million years ago. I'm sort of going by time, and I've got to talk about Kenyanthropus. All right, I've left Afarensis for a moment. We'll come back. Yep. But before we yeah. follow with that, uh, what do you think about the analogous, analogous, what kind of speciation do we have? Did Onomensis evolve into Afarensis? Is this an anagenetic speciation, or is it a branching, a cladogenetic speciation? Right now, the latest Onomensis fossil is the skull that you saw, 3.8 million years old. The earliest Afarensis fossils, that frontal bone that I showed you, 3.9 million years old. So the earliest Afarensis is earlier than the latest onomensis. That suggests that there was some split, some branching. What we don't know is how long before those fossils, the branching happened. Onomensis and afarensis, I have to tell you guys, are not so different from each other. There are differences and they're consistent, but they're not so different. 
many anthropologists view this as one lineage that has evolved one into the other. It is totally possible. It would be nice to have more fossils of that time period, just to say, are there pattern differences that are really emerging? I'm, the entire case for them overlapping is based on the difference in this part of the frontal bone between two individuals. And what is your bet? My bet is that their ancestry goes deeper and that their similarities, um, their similarities are common ancestry, right? But their similarities um, will, will be um, retained over some period of time that they are separated but may be interacting. I kind of think, if I'm looking at what we know about the later fossil record and think, what does this mean for the earlier one? I think probably there's, they branch off, there's different subspecies that are geographic and they're in contact with each other. They exchange some genes um, and then one of them survives and becomes different and the other one becomes extinct. Kenyanthropus may be the same way, honestly. This is a good question to ask right here. Kenyanthropus, this fossil is the type specimen the most complete, comes from the west side of Lake Turkana, this place called Lomequi, and is represented by fossils that are as early as 3.5 million years and as late as 3 million years. So it's about a half million years of time. That's a half million years that overlaps with Operensis. Operensis, 3.9 to 3.0. Operensis is known from Ethiopia, from Kenya, I'll show you in southern Kenya, and from Tanzania. Kenyanthropus is only identified in the west side of Lake Turkana. Let me show you the fossils. This skull, which you're going to see Afarensis skulls in a moment, this skull has a relatively flat face with wide and, and cheekbones that, that are continuous into the maxilla, the alveolar part of the maxilla. It has, um, excuse me, it has a lot of distortion, and I want to say that beginning, right, because we're, where there's a debate over Kenyanthropus is centered on the preservation of this fossil. Um, here you can see from the side, wow, it's really distorted. There's a temporal bone that's a second individual that matches much of the anatomy of this, of this skull, uh, temporal bone. So to the extent that it has commonalities, including things like a small ear, um, those commonalities are shared. But here it is compared to the most complete of the Afarensis skulls. You're going to see this in a moment again from Hadar. And they contrast in some ways. The Hadar skull is more robust. It has bigger jaw muscles, bigger teeth. Its cheekbones are more sort of back. Right? There are aspects of these populations that are different. When this was published and announced in 2001, uh, Meve Leakey, who was chiefly responsible, and also Fred Spoor, who was her collaborator, um, emphasized that the Kenyanthropus skull has a lot of similarities with this other skull, which is on the right here. This skull is a later skull, which we attribute to Homo. This is a Homo rudolfensis skull, K-N-M-E-R 1470. And so the story about Kenyanthropus was a story that maybe this is closer to Homo somehow, and we need to recognize that there could be a lineage there that's closer to Homo. I will say, from the history of paleoanthropology, every paleoanthropologist who has worked on this time period has been looking for the lineage of Homo that was missing, and every fossil that they've found is that. No matter what it is, you'll, you're going to see about five of these today, and it's all the same, right? It's all, I found the earliest, I found the ancestor, I found that. Fossils are fossils, and in this case, there are a lot of fossils. There are hundreds of teeth from this area of Lake Turkana, from this time frame, that are pretty consistent in their picture. There's also some material from the east side of Lake Turkana that historically has been called Afarensis, this is, let me tell you, it is not possible to distinguish if Kenyanthropus and Afarensis are different, it is not going to be told by this part of their skull. So there you have it. Okay, 
Now I take us to, this is the Turkana skull that I just showed you next to a Hadar skull at the bottom from Ethiopia. Now I'm going to show you Hadar now. Okay. Hadar is one of the most famous and fundamental sites in all of human origins. And most of the Hadar fossils have been attributed to Australopithecus afarensis. It is a very productive site in this time frame from about 3.4 million to about 2.9 million years. I love it. There are lots of fossils from Hadar. Many of them I've studied, some of them I haven't studied. These two characters, uh, Don Ezra Hansen on the left and Tim White on the right, very famous scientists for their analysis of this fossil sample. And the Hadar fossils at the time that they were found were the earliest, they weren't the earliest hominins. There were those couple that I mentioned, but they were the earliest that could be attributed to a species where you could see what the picture was. And so there's a lot of resources available that compare Afarensis, this species, with other primates to show how hominins are different. Big teeth relative to mandibular size, thick mandibles, small canine teeth to represent the diversity in Afarensis, so some quite large individuals and some smaller individuals in terms of mandibular size, dental size, in terms of some aspects of mandibular morphology. I put this one here to show you the top tooth on both of these images is the third premolar. And you can see that tooth is pretty different between these jaws, which are otherwise kind of similar. The difference is on the left, into AL-277, this premolar looks like it belongs to the teeth further back. It's like big and expanded. And on the right, it looks smaller, sort of more like an ape-like tooth. Um, yeah, just variation, variation, variation. There are additional sites from both well-known field areas like the Middle Awash, this site, Neferetu, uh, is one of those. Um, there are... Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, canine size. I emphasize that these early hominins had small canines. This is a human canine on the far left and an Afarensis canine in the mandible and a chimpanzee, uh, this is a female bonobo canine, I think, that is in the center. And you can see, when I say small, they're not like human small. They retain, you know, some quite large canine dimensions. Um, but here's an intermediate sized one, right, with a human on the right, the chimpanzee on the left, Afarensis in the center, this reduction compared to um, chimpanzees, bonobos, other primates. Okay, maxillae. Mandibles, here's some more mandibles. Yeah, I gotta tell you guys, you're already excited by the teeth. It is, <laughs> let's look at other things, right? With Afarensis, we know a lot about the skeleton. We know a lot about this species. Um, chimpanzee on the right, Afarensis on the left, and the big difference, right, is that the pelvis is totally different. Afarensis has a human structure to its body. It is not structured like another primate. The brain size is a little bit bigger than chimpanzees and bonobos, but not much. Um, the teeth are different. They're less visible in this comparison, but those dental differences matter. These teeth function differently. Okay. Yeah, here's, let's see some skulls. This is until about the year 2000. This was the most complete cranium of Afarensis. Um, and it was reconstructed really nicely by Bill Kimball to give you sort of models to work with. But today, we have more complete remains, the AL444 skull, which is really nice. Um, this is from the side. You've got uh, the a relatively complete juvenile individual, also from AL333. At Dikika, this is a famous site because of the Dikika skeleton that uh, that has a really wonderfully complete skull that was reconstructed very nicely by Philip Goons and collaborators uh, just a couple of years ago. This skull from Hadar, ALA22, is the most complete uh, skull that represents, um, in the opinion of the excavators, a female individual compared to AL444 on the right. 
And the most famous female individual is the one that doesn't have a great skull, right? Lucy, um, AL288. Lucy is a very small individual. Our ideas about body size in early hominins have really been centered on two skeletons. One of them, the skeleton of Lucy. Lucy stood about 106 centimeters and in weight, something like 28 to 35 kilograms. So this is, you know, not big. Lucy is approximately the same size as an individual from Sturckfontein, STS-14. So there's a pattern of some small individuals in Australopithecus, and most of the textbooks will tell you Australopithecus was small and Homo is big. This skeleton from Corsidora, Offerensis, 3. I think six million years old in this case, is bigger. This skeleton represents an individual that was 165 centimeters tall, more or less, and um, probably something like 45 to 50 kilograms, maybe a little heav heavier than that. Um, taking us back to skeletons, that skeleton, second from the left, Katanumu, big man is what Katanumu means, in Afar, in Afar um, is showing us that this size variation, which is evident from more fragmentary material, these two fossils from Hadar, here's a couple of femora from Hadar, um, that size variation is an important component of, of Australopithecus. There are individuals in Australopithecus who are the size, normal size, for humans. And I have to say, especially me, uh, being representing a country that is characterized by big and heavy people, um, it's really common for students to come into my classes and not recognize that normal size for humans is in this range of 150 to 170, 180 centimeters, and that Australopithecus there are individuals that are well outside of that. There are small Australopithecus individuals, but there's a lot of Australopithecus that are sort of human-sized, and a lot of humans that are sort of Australopithecus-sized, if you look at that that way. Okay. The pelvis, you guys, maybe many of you know, right? The pelvic shape of Australopithecus is human in most respects. It has short ilia, it has a flaring pelvis, its muscle orientations around the hips are set up for walking upright and standing upright. And that required a reorientation of those muscles and that caused an adaptation to the shape of the pelvis. However, its pelvis is oval. It's somewhat different in shape. They're wide and not long from front to back. And that may have consequences for gestation, for the birth process, those are things where people are very interested in understanding. How is Australopithecus different from recent humans? Here's Salam. It's a beautiful skeleton. Okay. Now, at the same time as Afarensis lived in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, Kenyanthropus lived in Turkana, there was another species also identified in Ethiopia. This species, only known so far from two of the Waranso meal sites, uh, Bertelli and Waitaleta, is Australopithecus deiremida. This was identified by Johannes Haile Selassie in 2015, and it's represented by a few fossils. Those fossils are more human-like in the elements that Haile Selassie identified than Afarensis is. It has a smaller anterior dentition, smaller front teeth. It has a more uh, less projecting subnasal area of the jaw and also less sort of prognathic um, mandible. And if I compare Africanus, which you'll see in a moment, Afarensis on the far right with Deiremida in the center, 
Deiramida sort of fits into this pattern a bit, but is characterized by smaller teeth and a somewhat more human-like orientation of the, of, the, of the maxilla. Those are the features that Johannes points to in saying this is something a little different from afarensis. So far, we know little about it, and it's very difficult to test. I have to say, in terms of new things in paleoanthropology, this is now you know, close to 10 years old, 8 years old, and it's one of those where some anthropologists would just like to have more fossils. Others, like me, ask the logical question. If this fossil species is there, and Offerensis is also there, and there's another field site with many more fossils that is around 20 kilometers away, and it has Offerensis and not Deiramida, what makes the difference, right? Why is this found here and not here when they're very close? It is possible that Hadar is full of Deiramida that hasn't been identified. It is possible that Deiramida is a variant that didn't last very long or that came from somewhere else for some short period and wasn't there very often. It's possible that Deiramida is Offerensis. I don't know the answer to this, but the reason why it comes in today, and the reason, <laughs> the reason fundamentally why I thought, I need to show you actually all these, is because when we talk about the origin of Homo, it could be Deiramida. It's one of the more Homo-like species that's been identified. It could be the ancestor of Homo. If it is, we have to answer the question, how did it coexist with these other species? And you will find when we look at the other species of Homo that occur later in time, we have the same question. How did these species coexist? Okay, now I'll take us briefly to South Africa. The fossil sample of Australopithecus africanus comes from Sturkfontein, Taung, and the Makapan sites. And these three sites, all of them identified more than 80 years ago. Um, right now, we're about 80 years with Makapan. Australopithecus africanus, you see here, I've got this tremendously long bar. It goes from 3.6 million years to almost 2 million years. I'll say a few words about the site and its dating when I talk about sites, but I want to highlight this is a species that is represented by large fossil samples that is pretty centrally important and is in phylogenetic terms, closer to today's humans than Afarensis is. Okay, the most famous and recognizable fossil is this one, Taung. It's from the northwest province of South Africa, and it was identified by Raymond Dart in 1924. So this was a, you know, the first discovery of any early hominin anywhere, and the first African fossil that was clearly a root to human evolution that was more divergent than anything in Eurasia or Europe. Dart recognized many of the ways that this is different from juvenile apes. This is a juvenile individual. Um, we think today something like three to four years old. And um, he recognized lots of ways it's different from apes, many of them dental. It was Dart that recognized the very big molar, thick molar teeth. And this contrast I highlight actually for my students, and it's worth saying something. Um, Taung here on the right, a juvenile gorilla on the left. I just want to direct your attention to the incisors at the front of the Taung jaw, because here's what the fossil looks like today. And that damage is damage that's been done by anthropologists. So if you wonder about, you know, studying the fossil record and you know, the value of sharing data and archiving data that when doing non-destructive methods, all of this destruction happened because of the calipers, because anthropologists all want to measure the same thing. You would think that at some stage we would trust Raymond Dart's measurements <laughs> and just say, oh, Dart already measured these teeth. I don't need to put my calipers on them. But in fact, the anthropologists never trust each other's measurements. They always come in and are measuring again and again. And every so often, a little piece of tooth chips off. 
and the fossils get smaller and smaller. So it's one of the depressing things about paleoanthropology. Tong has an endocast, and I want to say a couple of words about endocasts. Endocasts are natural impressions of the inside of the skull. Much argument has happened about the shape of the Tong endocast and the shape of endocasts in general. They can tell us a few things about different parts of the brain and their relative sizes. And so that is valuable information. But people can over-accentuate. They can you know, imagine that they tell you more than they do. And that's a challenge in studying these. I find this studying the endocast of Homo naledi. I find it you know, in, with my colleagues' work. Um, we pay a lot of attention to brains. As you'll find, brains don't tell us everything. Tong is what it is. It's a skull of a child. And it was alone for about a dozen years. And then Robert Broom, paleontologist, doctor, physician, um, who is very famous for discovering reptiles from the Permian era, more than 250 million years ago, said, I think that there's hominins that, besides Tong, and I want to find them. And he began to work with a mine owner outside of Johannesburg at a place called Sturkfontein and said, you know, you're finding lots of fossils in the mine where you're mining. Please let me know if you find a fossil that's, you know, interesting, looks like, you know, something. And he did. It was not these. In fact, the first fossil, STS-1, was such a, the first fossil, TM-1516, um, was such a bad fossil that it's like, oh, really? Oh, I have to deal with this? And it wasn't until the discovery of STS-5, this one at the top left, that everybody was like, oh, of course, Tong is there. Um, but we today have a big, big record of fossils from Sturkfontein. And I just want to show you that we have a lot of them. There's a lot of crania from Sturkfontein. Here's nine of them from the side. This is TM-1511, it's a terrible, terrible endocast, plus you know, parts of a very distorted skull. Some of them are not in great shape. Some of them are in amazing shape. Here's STS-5 on the left, compared to STW-505 on the right. Some people think that this is a female-male comparison. It's certainly a size difference. Here's another you know, sort of showing you size variation. All of these fossils that I'm showing you now, there's one exception in all the ones that I've shown you, are from an area of Sturkfontein called Member 4, and it's an amazing giant fossil deposit with lots of different kinds of fossils, not just hominins. So we know a lot about Australopithecus africanus. We know a good bit about its variation. We don't know how much of the variation is attributable. This is Africanus on the right and Afarensis on the left. They're pretty similar, honestly, many of these. Some Africanus individuals have even bigger molar teeth and more robust morphology, bigger sort of muscle morphology than Afarensis does. But Afarensis has some individuals that were clearly bigger body size in their lifetime. And Africanus, we have not found any really big individuals. That's an interesting thing about the South African sample. It has actually less size variation than the Afarensis sample did. STS-7 is a partial skeleton. Um, yeah, postcranial material. You can see actually here, these are, this is Lucy's, AL-288 is Lucy's, but all the rest are from Sturkfontein, uh, Swartkrans, SK-97. There's a lot of consistency in size in these South African fossils. STW-53, partial skull, I think probably Afrikanus also, but I put this in to mention that there is some disagreement or vari variation of opinion among anthropologists about how many species are represented in the Sturkfontein sample. STW-53, often called Homo, Homo habilis, and I'll talk about it with habilis. Um, I think it's Africanus for various reasons, but, but I want to show you that there is variation among people in what they think. STW-252 is a 
not very well preserved skull with a very good dental preservation where the teeth are bigger molars, bigger premolars than other individuals, but also big canines and big incisors. Um, I've got it here compared to a Swartkrans individual, that's Paranthropus. Paranthropus is known for much bigger teeth, but as you can see, this Sturkfontein fossil has teeth just as big, but they're totally different in the front of the jaw. Swartkrans, this Paranthropus individual, um, I will use the pointer on this one, if it's on, because you see this canine tooth? It looks like a baby canine. It's tiny, right? Compared to, whoa! Paranthropus is characterized by small anterior teeth, right? This is what we call robust species, robust Australopiths. Um, they are robust in having big jaws, big jaw muscles, big attachments for jaw muscles, big molars, big premolars, but they have itty bitty canine and incisor teeth. Here's an individual that has big molars, big premolars, big canines, big incisors, something different going on. This difference, Ron Clark um, has paid a lot of attention to, and he really feels that there's a, another species represented here, a species that is different in its dental morphology from the other Africanus fossils. He calls this Australopithecus prometheus, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Here's a juvenile from Swartkrans, which, um, which has often been called early homo. Postcranially, we know a good bit about Africanus. STS-14 and 431 are two partial skeletons. Um, the spine of STS-14 is inspirational, right? This is a beautiful spine that shows you the lumbar curve that humans share uh, with a thoracic sort of opposite curve. Um, it's a really nice thing. Okay. And the pelvis of STS-14. Yeah, we know a lot about this. These are all bipeds. They're all walking like us. They all have big arms relative to their body size, but not chimpanzee length, just bigger than humans, and big joint surfaces for their arms. Okay, so Makapanskat. This is a, another site found in the late 1940s by uh, Raymond Dart students who began working there, and has a number of hominin <coughs> fossils, all of them usually attributed to Africanus today, but Dart, when he studied this one, this little piece of the back of a skull, said, I think this is something different. Its head is bigger. Its jaw muscles are also very big. They're converging, they're gonna align at the top. I think this is a different species. Dart had become convinced that the Makapanskat sample were representing animal bones that had been burned in fires. They were blackened, they had a coloration to them. Dart thought that some of the broken animal bones might have been used as tools for weapons by the hominins. Dart decided that this was the first species to use fire. So he named it Prometheus, Australopithecus Prometheus. That usage fell away. By around, he was writing about this from 1948 onwards. By the late 1950s, Dart had become convinced that Prometheus is not a thing. This is all Africanus. And it was changes to the way that evolutionary biologists use species that really convinced him. Before the 1940s, you had lots and lots of species. Like these fossils I've shown you already from that time period were already classified as Australopithecus africanus, uh, Plesianthropus transvalensis, Australopithecus prometheus. Right? People were just naming species like left and right. And in the 1950s, biologists decided enough species. There's variation inside a species and there's polymorphism and you just got to cut back on this. And that's what really anthropologists began to do. They began to put everything into a few species. That trend has reversed to some extent. I say to some extent because you've already heard me say 
Australopithecus varro ghazali, Australopithecus degiremida, Kenyanthropus platyops, Australopithecus onamensis. You've already heard all these species names. So you know that people are not hesitant to name things today. We are naming things, as someone who's named species, we are naming things over a broader time interval and with a broader knowledge than would have been the case in the 1930s and 40s. So our names mean a little more, but still have the problem. We want to test them, right? We want to know the difference. Prometheus is pertinent today because many of you know about this fossil on the right, this skeleton, Littlefoot. Littlefoot is the most complete fossil skeleton in our ancestry up to Neanderthals. Right? It's a beautiful, wonderful fossil. It represents almost all of the individual. There's some parts gone, but not a lot. And, and it is a wonderful thing that took a very long time to separate from the rock that enclosed it. This fossil, Ron Clark has largely studied, and he notes many of the similarities between this skull in its teeth and its morphology and the larger toothed examples from Sturkfontein and thinks that they really are a different thing from the smaller toothed things from Sturkfontein. And he has revived the, the concept of Homo, oh, excuse me, of Australopithecus Prometheus. So today it's not uncommon to see publications that talk about Prometheus. Prometheus is not, out of all of these, if Prometheus is really a thing, it is not an ancestor of Homo. That I'm comfortable with. The extent to which it's different, it's different because it's becoming larger toothed and is going in this direction of Paranthropus. But it raises this sort of continuing question of diversity. How do we recognize diversity? When we see diversity, what explains its persistence? OK. Now we enter the final phase of Australopithecus. I'm going to talk about Australopithecus gari, which is not on the tree. No wonder I didn't have that tree there before. It's not on the tree. I'll talk about Australopithecus gari. That's sorry, this is the Paranthropus tree that I stuck here. Gari and also um, Australopithecus sediba. OK, so Gari. This fossil uh, skull comes from a place called Buri in Ethiopia, also the Middle Awash, published by Tim White and his collaborator, Burhani Asfa, uh, in 1999. And it's a lovely skull. It has, as you can see, kind of a projecting face with here it is in the center, compared to Afarensis on the left and Boisei, a much later hominid on the right. But I just want to emphasize that Gari has big teeth. Gari is kind of like the, the East African version of that South African big-toothed Australopithecus I showed you. Right? If, if there was a Prometheus of East Africa, Gari would be it. And in terms of its morphology, it is very comparable to Afarensis in a lot of ways. In some ways, actually, more sort of has bigger jaw muscles in some respects. Um, uh, here I've compared them. Yes, Gari on the left compared to that STW-252 on the right. I think this is a really good comparison in dental size, in dental proportions. Um, when it was published in 1999, um, Asfa and his and White um, judged that this might be really interesting for the evolution of Homo, and their reasoning for this was that there are animal bones, horse bones and gazelle bones, with cut marks and with percussion marks that are found at this site. This is actually a hominin that's found in association with behavioral evidence. And so their thinking was, we're finding behavior. They at the same time mentioned that there's a skeleton from a different site nearby from the same time frame, about 2.5 million years ago. That skeleton has been published in, uh, in a dissertation, and a lot of people are interested in it as a possible skeleton of early Homo. I'm not going to talk about it today, um, because the dissertation photos are not great, but it is 
it is published. Okay. Yeah, let me just skip this, skip some teeth. And these two hominins, WT17000 and this Buri skull, Gari, WT17000 is often called Paranthropus ethiopicus. I'm not going to talk about Paranthropus today in any kind of detail, other than to mention there's this robust, big toothed form that continues to exist while Homo evolves. Um, but these two are about the same age. And they're not far from each other, really. Um, so there is this kind of um, diversity of morphology that is existing already. OK. Finally, in Australopithecus, we have Australopithecus sediba. Sediba, the fossils are from one place, Malapa in South Africa. And the fossils are, their age is fairly precisely known. They're about 1.97 million years old, so just under 2 million. The most complete, there's two relatively complete skeletons from Sediba. This one is MH1, which has a beautiful skull and represents a child of about six to eight years. In morphological terms, Sediba has a pattern of morphology that we call a mosaic, with some features that clearly are similar to other Australopithecus, and some features that are more similar to Homo. Its brain has interesting changes to its frontal lobe that are actually convergent with Homo, but not fully like the, the, the frontal lobes of Homo. MH1 on the right here, MH2 on the left. MH2 is an individual that's an adult. We infer to be probably female based on tooth size and pelvic morphology. MH1, we infer to be juvenile male. The arms of Sediba are basically like Australopithecus arms. They're really well made for climbing. Its spine is really well made for bipedal movement, but also for suspension. Its pelvis, um, Sediba on the left and right, Lucy in the middle, its pelvis has more vertically sort of directed ilia. It has a pubis that also is more narrow and, and extends a little bit more inferiorly. As Sediba has a homo-like pelvis. It doesn't have a Lucy-like or STS-14-like pelvis. OK, and many phylogenetic analyses at this stage have been done. Sediba nests next to Homo or inside of Homo. So this is the closest relative that we found in fossil record of our genus, Homo. We don't know precisely where it came from. OK, so that is an overview of all of Australopithecus. You got it all. Now it's time for a break. But before a break, I'll be happy to take any last questions, or I'll be happy to take them after the break, if you mull over during a break. Anything immediate? Let's have a couple. Let's have a break, yeah. You have some? Let's do them. Yes. Well, you said that there were two uh, skeletons in which height was based. And you said that one was Lucy, but you didn't say which one. Katanumu. Katanumu, yes. Is uh, from, um, it's from KSD, uh, Corsidora, uh, which is in the Waranso Meal area. So and it's your. More or less the same height. No, very different in height. Yeah. In fact, I can answer that question very efficiently by... Because that leads me to the next yeah. question, which is sexual dimorphism. This is the record of height for all hominins before one million years ago. And height is known from many different indicators. Skeleton. Yep. Oh, oh shoot, it's gone. Um, hang on, hang on. Sorry, I've got to play it. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, this is the record of height 
from every fossil that, where we can estimate height between four and one million years. This is mostly Australopithecus with some Paranthropus, and as you get after two million years, Homo. The estimates are made based on regressions from the length of a femur or the length of a tibia or some, you know, some, in some cases, humerus, sorry, estimates where you know the length, and also from footprint evidence, because from the length of a footprint, you can estimate height from a regression. So you see the, the ones shaped like feet are footprint estimates. The nice thing about those is that we have more of them in some periods than we have bones. And what you notice is this earlier time, this earliest time period, the, the X's here and the footprints and this X here, this is all afarensis. Every one of those is afarensis. And the large one there with the X is uh, Katanumu, is that big skeleton. Lucy is the smallest one. So we have variation, but that variation is actually following a pattern and Afarensis variation, you see, is actually not so different from early Homo variation. What we don't have in erectus, like when we get to Homo erectus, which are I think these squares, right? Well, erectus are diamonds, like diamonds. We don't have as small as Lucy, but we have some small ones. And so hominins stature story, yeah, it's an extensive range. The exception is these bluish triangles in the middle. That is Africanus. No South African fossils that we found have this big body size. And that's interesting, because we've got, as you can see, there's a lot of them. So where are they? Are, why aren't there any big ones? I don't know the answer to that. So there's a body size, yeah. Okay. And lumping and smoothing. Yep. I really have to say a lot about it. Yeah. And my best will be that you will be more than a lumper, more a lumper than a skipper. Yep. Right? Usually, yeah. But what do you think about this? I mean, can you go on a little bit more? Yeah, sure. I think that the population structure of hominins was not very different from the population structure of chimpanzees or of gorillas or of even orangutans. But those vary a bit. Um, chimpanzees have subspecies today that are regional, that live in different parts of Africa, and the ancestry of those spe subspecies goes back to a half million years or a little longer. Chimpanzees and bonobos separated about two million years ago, more or less. Bonobos have an ancient lineage that contributed to them that we've recovered from genetics that maybe differentiated three and a half million years ago. So if you look at chimpanzees today, we call the four groups of chimpanzees subspecies. They have some behavioral differences we note. They have a few anatomical differences. They're, they're different regions. Gorillas, today's gorillas belong to two species that diverged from each other about a million years ago. And the two species are each recognized of two subspecies. So you have mountain and lowland eastern gorillas and um, western lowland gorillas and cross river gorillas. And we call the ones that differentiated a half million years ago or less subspecies and the deeper one species. If I look at these Australopithecus, look at the times we have. Some of them are separated by two million years, and they're okay, but probably Sediba is not the same as Afarensis, right? Or, but the ones that lived at the same time, Afarensis, Kenianthropus, Deuremida, Africanus, right? They're living at the same time. Maybe they're regionally different, Africanus, is different because it lives in a different place. Um, maybe there's, maybe Baro Ghazali is living in a different place. If these were chimpanzees, we might call them subspecies. There are some anatomical differences that are consistent that 
we paid a lot of attention to, but I think my, my framework for this is, okay, they had ancestors a half million years before, a million years before. They're not that different. They're in a breeding where they come into contact. I think they're probably, if we were biologists today, and the question is, do they fit the Endangered Species Act or not? We would elevate, we would say, oh yeah, they're species. But if we ask which of these is ancestral to Homo, the answer might be all of them. Maybe they all contribute something, right? Because they're interbreeding to some degree. Yeah. Okay, two more questions, mm -hmm. but I will maybe spend in just one. Yeah. So, what is the relationship between the fossil records from the east side and the fossil records from, from, from the, the south side? Africa? Yeah. And, and in that sense, what can we infer about behavior from the Australopithecine sample? Yep. The, um, in this time frame with Australopithecus, I'll leave Paranthropus aside. With Australopithecus, our challenge is the date of Africanus. Because if I want to compare them, I want to compare the ones that are living at the same time. Yes, we'll talk about the date. But if Africanus is the same time as Canianthropus, Afarensis, etc., then their ecological difference is not great. They seem to be similar in diet terms. They are accentuating molar teeth in the same way. They've, you know, um, there seems to be some more variation of body size in East Africa, which maybe is ecological. Maybe they're using open space more, and in South Africa they're climbing more or something. Um, the, I think that there is a primary difference ecologically in temperature and altitude. South Africa is high and cold compared to the Rift Valley sites. There are high sites, and including one, Contis, near Nairobi, where we have Afarensis. Um, Lytoli is not low, right? It's high. So there's an altitude similarity, but there's a real latitude difference. And I think that that creates some different ecology. I think the, the role of the East African monsoon is different. A challenge is that we don't know the paleo environment as well in that time frame, but we're getting to know a lot about it, you know. And so now in the latest part of this, Sediba is really different. Sediba is interestingly different. First, because its diet is super different. Sediba eats like a chimp. It's got, uh, it's relying only on C3 plants for its resources. It's eating the inner bark of trees. Right, we've got lots of evidence of its diet, and um, and so we haven't found that sort of thing with East African hominins at that time. The challenge is, of course, by two million years ago, we've got Homo erectus on the scene. So our question of East versus South, suddenly we're like, oh, there's another player in this, mm -hmm. and it is erectus. Yeah. Okay. Let's have, Let's have a break. How long do you want to break? Uh, how about 20 minutes? 20 minutes? Sounds great. Yeah, super. All right. Thank you, everybody. Great. <laughs> they tolerated it better than my graduate students. But
Okay. Ah, excellent. Okay. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good stretch. I did. Um, I, for the second part of today's presentation, I would like to talk about the places where we find fossils and the types of work that, that's done in them. Now, I have been fortunate to work at a number of places that have very different styles of work and very different preservation of fossils. And it is very interesting because the kinds of information that we can obtain from some sites is very rich and deep, and we know a lot about a lot of individuals sometimes, or we know, you know a lot about the entire anatomy of a skeleton. In other cases, we maybe only know a very small amount about a skeleton or a part of an individual, but those types of sites sometimes have other knowledge or information that comes in. In this presentation, I will talk about some sites in South Africa, including some sites where I have worked and also sites where other people are working, and that include cave sites primarily. I will talk about some open air sites in other parts of the world. I'll talk about um, um, a, a site called Sangaran in Indonesia. I'll talk about a site called Shangchen in China, and I'll talk about Olduvai Gorge. And I'll also put in a really important site, Dimenisi, in the Republic of Georgia, which has kind of a hybrid of uh, cave geology and open air geology. My goal with these presentations is to convey um, why we know some things from some sites and not others, and what the complexities can be in interpreting the data from a site. Nowhere is that more evident than the first site that I'm going to talk about, which is Sturkfontein in South Africa. Now, this site is in the news recently because of new approaches to figure out the age of some of the fossils that have put the age of some of the fossils of Australopithecus much earlier than most people had thought five or six years ago. And, and so I want to talk about this site. It's complexity and, um, and how people study it. The work that I'm going to talk about is being done by a team um, led primarily today by Dominic Stratford from the University of the Woodwatersrand in South Africa. And he has many collaborators, some of the most important uh, working on dates and geology are Laurent Bruxelles from France and also um, Daryl Granger from Purdue University in the United States. So this is Sturkfontein. Sturkfontein is a big cave, and you can go on tours, and it has uh, really large, massive underground galleries. It's a really large cave. It has an underground lake with water. Um, it has uh, underground fossil deposits. It has above-ground fossil deposits. It has an enormous complexity for that reason. Fossils have... Uh, represent animals that lived at really different times in some of these deposits. Um, the earliest ones may be as old as 3.7, 3.8 million years. The youngest ones are within sort of later middle Pleistocene times, you know, maybe two, three hundred thousand years ago. So that's a tremendous range. The, um, the setup of the geology of this site determines where fossils accumulated at different times. The site began to be investigated by Robert Broom, he's pictured here on the right, in 1936. And as he began to learn more, after the Second World War, he began also working with John Robinson, he is on the left, and these two did enormous work at Sturkfontein, also at Swartkrans, which is very near to Sturkfontein, only 800, oh, between these two sites, 
I think it's less than a kilometer at least. Um, so really, you know, they're concentrated in this area. I do want to sort of flip back to this map to just say this area, um, you can see the kilometer scale there on the bottom, which I think is a, is a five kilometer scale, yeah. Um, it is a relatively circumscribed area. And the sites in it mostly are cave sites. There are a few rock shelter sites. However, many of the cave sites, and I'm going to show you one of these, are caves that are no longer underground, that have you know, sort of only remains that are above the ground today. So Sturkfontein is one of the caves that has enormous cave galleries, and there are, there are many of those also. It's one of the rare ones that has you know, fossil investigation that is, that is still going on underground. OK. This is a photograph from the sky, an aerial photograph, of the site in the 1960s. After Broom and Robinson had worked there, uh, Robinson eventually immigrated to the United States, where he became a professor at the University of Wisconsin, actually. And uh, we actually have a legacy there from, Bro from uh, Robinson's time there. Um, at a certain stage, the property was for sale, and the University of the Rand bought the property and became the landowner of the Sturkfontein site. And at that stage, Philip Tobias began uh, his direction of the site, and they began to document, in this case with aerial photography, the site. This shed that you see in the center is right next to an outdoor large fossil deposit. That gash that's running up the center of the, of the photo is a gash in the landscape that leads into the cave, but also is around fossil deposits that are outside the cave today. That shed is still there, so this is something that you can register on photos. The outside portion is where most of the familiar fossils are from, and um, this is work that's happening there sort of early in the history. The guy that is there on the boards is Alan Hughes, who was working with Tobias and directing the excavations at the site for many years. As they worked this quarry, which would, was originally exploited by mining for lime, um, to explain the South African sites briefly, these caves have existed um, some of them for more than 2 million, 3 million years. They are in a very ancient layer of dolomite that is a rock that formed 2.5 billion years ago or longer and is exposed in this part of South Africa. Further to the south, it dives underground. It's covered. And so that rock layer exists in other places. Um, in the area north of Johannesburg and west of Pretoria, it is exposed on the surface, and the caves became exposed with the dolomite. Once they were exposed, animals began to enter them and sometimes left their bones inside. Sometimes, in the case of hominins, would leave artifacts inside also. Um, the, however, the landscape continued to erode. And as it continued to erode, areas of caves that were underground, the roof collapsed, and now they're above the ground. Now they're on the surface of the ground. And as erosion continues, the cave deposits erode, and they go away. So you have a succession of caves which are already formed underground, opening, having animals be able to enter them, enter their entrances, um, shelter around them, and leave bones inside of them, and then having the cave erode so that this isn't a cave anymore, and then having the, the deposits disappear. Um, we're going to see several different examples of that and the different situations that it creates. Yes? They are separate systems that are defined by fault lines, and underground faults uh, become areas where water can infiltrate into the dolomite and form larger cavities. The dolomite caves largely follow the dip of the dolomite layers in this area. Um, and, um, and so a cave may open in one place, and as erosion happens, it just runs further, further down, and the cave is more and more exposed. 
in there are areas that are relatively firm dikes or as, as the cave dips that separate other layers of dolomite and those never connect in some cases. Um, sometimes water enters these and streams actually begin to flow through them and it creates an underground water network and that can extend quite far. Uh, but those water networks are not areas where we can investigate today. Yeah. Um, I should let you know there is a water network inside of Sturkfontein Cave and exploration of it by underground, by divers, cave divers, um, led to one cave diver dying in the 1970s. And so no underground exploration underwater is happening uh, since then. Okay, so you can see that he's working on a complex surface. It's got these sort of rock protruding sort of areas and also these areas that are very scooped out. In part, in some areas, this is created by miners. The miners are there not for gold, but for calcium carbonate. Um, and they're using, they're exploiting the calcium carbonate from the mines to burn in a kiln to create active calcium carbonate that is used then in concrete, but also in the gold mining process. Uh, gold mining has a highly acid process where cyanide is used to bind to gold, and the lime becomes the neutralizer for the acid. So it was commercially valuable in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and very poor miners would go out with mules and, uh, and dynamite and blast the caves. And today, most of the caves have some evidence of this mining activity. They blasted it. That has been good for the paleontologists in some ways because it allowed the discovery. The fossils would never have been discovered because they're in hard rock, many of them. But it's bad because the context of many of the fossils has been destroyed. And it's very difficult to work out where fossils come from. This is the mine area today. Um, the quarry on the top of the hillside. And today there are catwalks that go overhead. A lot of this was initially mining at the site but a lot of this has been removed by the anthropologists. So this is excavation space. This large area over the site is mostly Sturkfontein member four. And the fossils in it are mostly Australopithecus africanus. However, there is an area of the site that extends that is a later deposit. And this deposit is known as Sturkfontein member five. So this is an overhead view that shows sort of how these interact with each other. Here's some of the fossils that come from member four. All right. So when we go underground, we see additional complexity. And so there's fossil deposits that are breccia, uh, breccia the concrete, uh, agglomeration of, of gravel and calcium carbonate, flowstone, and, um, and um, fossils into a hard concrete-like rock. Um, those rocks are very typical in the South African caves. And you can see the breccia layers that are going down that represent a talus that was coming in from former entrances that today have eroded so that the surface is sort of scooped out and exposing fossils from different times. These formed initially when an opening above ground formed and things fall into it or come into it. And so you form this, this sort of pile that has layers that correspond to the successive sort of formation of, of a deposit. Um, in some places, this is not in Sturkfontein. This is another cave that, that's used as an example in the paper that I brought this from. But you can see what those taluses look like. We have taluses like that in many of the sites, where it is an active entrance, where gravel has been coming in. Sometimes these contain archaeology. Usually, when they have this kind of form, they are later Pleistocene, so in the last maybe few hundred thousand years. 
And the Sturkfontein site, historically, um, since the 1970s, as people began to try to figure out how old are these fossils, at first it was very difficult. Those days, the techniques to determine the age of fossils relied very heavily on volcanic material. Um, the potassium argon technique, for example, which relies on volcanic ash. Those ash layers are not prominent in South African sites. Today, it is possible to use cryptotephra, so microscopic particles of ash, where you can chemically identify the eruption source and get some evidence about the age of the deposit. So an example of this is um, on the South African uh, coast, a uh, site called Pinnacle Point um, has uh, very small ash particles from the Toba volcanic eruption in Indonesia that happened 74,000 years ago. So in this case, we know, oh, there's Toba particles. That gives us the p potential of using that method, that chronology. But in the cave sites that are much earlier, that's not possible yet. We don't have that kind of volcanic chronology. So we're left in the 70s, they were left with very early types of uranium series dating. So they drilled boreholes into the site through the deposits, found flowstone layers, and used uranium series dating to, to estimate their age. That gave them a timeline that suggested that Sturkfontein was in the range of two and a half million years, so something like 2.5 million years old. Um, you'll see textbooks, that's the date. And if you say 2.1 to 2.6 or 2.7 or something like that, it's all the same, right? It's all, we're using a rough chronology. And you can see why. The fossil deposit is very large, and the parts that have calcium carbonate formations that are capable of being dated are far apart. So there's not so much you can do. During the 1990s, a number of scientists attempted to use electron spin resonance dating in this site, and that works on teeth. Teeth are a crystal, and the crystal and structure of the teeth has imperfections that can create holes for electrons to gather. And when ionizing radiation affects the teeth, those electrons build up. So um, you can measure this signal today. Everywhere has ionizing radiation. It's just a question of the rate. And in groundwater in South Africa, uranium is present. It decays and creates some ionizing radiation. And as a function of that, it enables us to estimate the age from ESR. ESR estimates were not especially helpful, however, at this time depth in the 1990s when they were being done. So they were consistent with the age that the flowstones were generating, but it didn't add a lot of information. In recent years, um, research has focused on a revision of the stratigraphic profile at Sturkfontein and also a technique that depends on rocks that came from outside where they were exposed to cosmic radiation and then were buried in the cave. This method is called cosmogenic nuclide dating. And the basic principle is that if a rock is sitting on the surface, it's absorbing radiation from space. And some of that radiation um, causes um, silicon and aluminum to change through nuclear reaction to beryllium and I'll forget the other one. But there's a, there's a nuclear reaction that happens because these are very high energy particles. After the burial, the radioactive components of that go away. And so you can estimate how long ago something has, was buried from that signal. That started on Sturkfontein member five. And I want to show you this one because this is, a, this is one that shows the pattern of excavation at Sturkfontein during the 1960s and 1970s. This is a common pattern of excavation at sites in South Africa. You dig where it's easy to dig. And where it's hard to dig, you don't dig. And you can see here this sort of very intricate sort of network, right? What is going on is that some of the fossil deposit is highly calcified. It's highly hardened. And some of it is either less calcified 
or it has been decalcified. When a calcified deposit, which is hard rock, is on the surface and rainwater is percolating through it, that rainwater dissolves some of the calcium and some parts of it can become decalcified. The decalcification, in many cases, leaves the fossils. So you have fossils that once were in hard rock that are still there in dirt. And that's wonderful if you're digging because you dig where it's dirt. <laughs> you don't dig where it's rock. It's bad for context because the rainwater did not follow the context that the fossils were in. The rainwater just did what rainwater does. So as a result, you have this real complexity. Today, there are sites like Chrome Dry and Dremolin where the digging is being done in decalcified deposit. And the teams who are working there, in Chrome Dry, Jose Braga and his research group, at Dremolin, uh, Andy Harries and Stephanie Baker and their research team, um, the teams that work there try to pay a lot of attention to the actual geological context that they're working in, right? Because they, they know that, that you can't just dig the decalcified part. <laughs> you have to keep track of where you are relative to the layers. Um, in the early days at Sturkfontein, that was less clear. Um, and so a lot of the context of fossils in the early you know, 1960s, 1970s excavations are uncertain. That's a problem because the other main way that we work out how old fossil sites are in southern Africa is based on the extinct animals that are in the sites. We have a chronology of pigs and horses and, and bovids from East Africa where the sites have chronological uh, estimates from, from geochronology. And when you find similar species in the South African sites, you know that they're similar age. In the South African sites, monkeys and horses are really important indicators. Horses, there's an ancient form of horse in Africa before 2.3 million years ago. After 2.3 million years ago, there's equus. And that's a really important age indicator at sites. Um, equus is today's, zeb all of today's horses are equus. And in, in Africa, it's zebras and their ancestors, donkeys and their ancestors, and, and of course, horses. So um, for a long time, there's been a debate about equus at Sturkfontein. There's a couple of equus teeth in some of these deposits. And the idea is, well, they have to be younger than 2.3. Today's team working there, um, led by Dominic Stratford, point out um, they dug <laughs> in this way, and this is the interface between member five deposits, which are definitely younger than 2.3, and member four, which are maybe earlier. So it's a problem. Um, the current way of looking at this site, and I won't go into the details about it, um, but the team working there now suggests that, you know, actually the cosmogenic nuclides are telling us that these rocks entered the deposits before three and a half million years ago. So, Sturkfontein member four and its contents are contemporary with Lomequi and uh, some of the earlier Afar sites that Afarensis, Kenyanthropus, and Afrikanus are living at the same time. The Littlefoot skeleton, which is the most complete skeleton of this site, comes from a different part of the cave, from member two, which is today underground in a deep cave chamber. And Cosmogenic dating there also suggests it's very old, 3.6, 3.7. Other anthropologists dispute this. They say, look, this doesn't look like it has three and a half million year old monkeys. It looks like it has two and a half million year old monkeys. Or this. We still have these equus teeth. So the context of the fossils with relation to the deposits is very important. And knowing the site in this way and its complexity, and seeing the excavation methods of the past is important to understand that. So one important thing about the limitations of sites is people can't always dig where you want to dig, <laughs> or it's not always practical to dig where you want to dig. I know this very well, working in a site where it's extremely difficult to enter the places where we want to dig. I can't go into these places, right? So it's like there's a limitation on what can be done. 
and what you can know. The same is true at Sturkfontein. I can go into all those places, um, but, um, but the team that's working there has to work with the constraints of past excavations. And, and the knowledge that's been built up over time, they have to work out how to revise it. Okay, so going back to my map, does anybody have a Sturkfontein question while we're on it? Okay. Going back to my map, yeah, go ahead, yeah. A bioturbation, yeah. Cryoturbation, no, yeah, because the, it's it's rarely freezing. Yeah, and the underground deposits are never near near freezing. Yeah, yeah. There are occasionally in caves um, flooding, because uh, if a cave entrance is near the water table or something, it can, yeah, it, really a lot of water can pass into caves. And the next slide I want to talk. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. How accurate is this indirect? The question is, how accurate is this, is this indirect dating? And the, the challenge is that you're always depending on your knowledge of the context and the precision of the context, right? Yes. Yeah, ESR is a direct dating, right? You're doing it on a tooth. Uranium series dating, you can also do on teeth. Uranium thorium dating never worked very well. Um, on these sites because it's, thorium is a rapid decay product and so it's very useful for more recent sites. Mm -hmm. The uranium lead method is what is accurate for these older sites, but it typically requires it, more material than you're getting from a tooth. So you lead dating is not very often done on teeth, it's often done on flowstones. Um, today people are innovating helium dating which is using the helium content from the uranium series. As this, and the cosmogenics is another new technique, right? Or relatively, it's been going on for now a while, but, but it's, as it's applied to sites, we begin to learn more about its limitations and more about situations where, you know, this is dating a rock that's going into the ground. A rock could go into the ground and then be redeposited by erosion underground in a cave setting and the time that it came underground is not necessarily the time that it ended up by a fossil. So it's contextual, right? If with every method, it's relying on understanding the context of the fossils. And the other question is about from a Uh-huh. Uh, where was it found? Can you remember? Yes, so inside the, um, deep inside the cave, um, is an area called the Silberberg Grotto. And this area is a side passage that is today, in, in, it's Sturkfontein, Sturkfontein, yeah. And it's deep underground. It's, uh, it had an opening that was open to the surface at the time that Littlefoot entered the cave and he fell, is, is what happened. And that deposit then has solidified in his hard rock. Um, the cosmogenic method suggests 3.6, 3.7. There is a flowstone that passes through parts of Littlefoot that is younger. I think it's 2.4 or something like that. And the question historically has been, is it the flowstone that, that dates Littlefoot or is it the cosmogenics? And today I say that I, I can report that that is still the debate, right? It's like there is an equus fossil that maybe is equus in the Littlefoot deposit. It's all this stuff, right? Which is um, which is complicated and not worth going into the details of because the bottom line is the people who know the most about it still disagree. <laughs> Even for me, who have studied much of what they've written, I'm like, okay, I see these people's point, I see these people's point. Yeah. But the other thing is, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that uh, David Barr said that some of the fossils of Carlopithecus uh, prometheus have mm -hmm. some burning. Yeah. Is it? Yes. That so, oh yes, thank you, thank you for bringing that back. Yes. So that's a great question. Yeah. Dart's idea about this in the 1950s was that the the fossils from Makapan, um, which were the ones that he knew and was was studying at that time, were burned. And this was animal bones, and I think in one case or two cases, hominin bones. Later, 
chemical analysis of these fossils showed that this is not burning. They're black because they're coated with a manganese dioxide, and that coloration is natural in the cave. It has nothing to do with burning. So today, um, fire is not recognized in these early deposits with, with these Australopithecus. In later sites in South Africa, Swartkrans and Van der Voort Cave are examples of this, um, there is evidence of, of actual burning of combustion and burned animal bone in the case of Swartkrans. Around, this is in Swartkrans member three, so it's around 800,000 to maybe 1.1 million years. Much more recent than, than Australopithecus, yeah. yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. The next site I will talk about is Dremolin. And I talk about this one because it is a site that was discovered in the mid-1990s, and research there has happened for the last um, 30 years or so. One famous fossil from this site is the earliest example of Homo erectus in the world. Uh, this fossil, DNH-134. It's a child example of Homo erectus and um, is about two million years old. So Dremelin's an important site, and it's a site that is a really good example of a South African, today, open air site that was formerly a cave. And it shows some of the complexity of these sites. So I wanted to show you this image which shows a bit of a map of the place. Um, the overhead view um, on the top right is showing two areas with fossils. One area is called the main quarry, that's MQ, and the other area is called the Dremel and Macondo, that's MK. And you can see here the Macondo excavation area and the main quarry. Dremelin is a site that occurs on a hill. And at the edge of the current hill, there is a sort of depression that is what was once underground as a cave. That depression is where fossils were discovered and is the main quarry. That's, that's where the fossils were found first. On the top of the hill, it looks like a hill. It's featureless, right? It's just, here's a hill. But... Ground penetrating radar today shows that there are areas where the bedrock is doing this sort of thing. You've seen this already at Sturkfontein, right? It's, it's an area that was a cave where there are now decalcified deposits. That type of deposit on a hillside, when, when those are forming channels and they're grooves like this, in South Africa, those are called Macondos. And so this area is a Macondo deposit. Um, those types of deposits have only been recognized commonly in South African anthropology for the last 20 or 30 years. So people weren't looking for deposits like this. They saw that there were places on hills where there were bits of ancient caves, and sometimes those have fossils. Crumb dry is an example. What they didn't recognize is that there were large areas that also were the bottom of the ancient cave, but today are covered in dirt. And they're not obvious until you actually do geological work. Um, so in Dremelin's case, the fossil, the hominin fossils so far are all coming from the main quarry, but the investigation has turned to this Macondo deposit as well. And to give you an example of what this looks like, right, it's a complex underground surface. Many of the South African sites have this kind of look. Crumb Dry looks like this now with excavation. Cooper's Cave is a site that looks like this. Um, these, are, these are sites that were not mined because the miners didn't recognize that there's anything underground there. <laughs> it's, it, it, it was too much work for anybody to think, oh, I'm going to dig here to see if there's any, anything underground. Um, today we're very interested in these because we know that there are fossil-bearing deposits in them. Sometimes the decalcified dirt contains the fossils. Sometimes the fossils are embedded in the walls of what is still calcified. This is the Dremelin main quarry excavation. You can see that it's, it's not an easy excavation. If you know and love excavations that have regular squares that are like 
cave excavations of this kind are not usually that, right? Because you're digging around the edges of highly calcified hard breccia. Um, if you want to remove something that is hard breccia, that is a major operation. And typically, in, in sites like this, people will be working the decalcified deposit and leaving what's calcified. So it's an impressive site. It's a big site. Um, the total area of the quarry site is um, probably twice the area of this room, right? This is a big room. It's, and you can see from the scale of the people, right? And uh, is now quite deep. It's probably as deep as this room in many places. So a lot of volume of sediment has been moved, most of it in the last 20 years. Yeah, this is a great sort of image of it. And what's very important in these types of sites, originally they formed as infills coming from outside the cave. And those infills have a logic to them. They follow gravity. They go downhill. They usually are forming some kind of slope. Sometimes it's possible to see the layering of these. Sometimes flowstone forms on top of them and creates a, a distinction. But fossils that are at different levels, if you measure them, might be the same time if the slope is you know, connecting them. And the way that these sites are worked, you have to keep very intricate track of what the geology looks like because you might only discover later another thing and you wonder if these are the same age or not. You have to have really impeccable record keeping. 3D scanning and maintenance of photogrammetric and LIDAR models have become super important to our work in these sites. So yeah, this is, this is a site that shows a photo that shows exactly the location of that early Homo erectus fossil. And it's a complex situation, you can see, right? It's this fossil ended up in this place. Working out how it ended up in that place, is it the bottom of something that's collecting stuff? Is it on a slope? Figuring out which things nearby it are the right things to estimate the age, right, is, is a challenge. So that kind of site is difficult. As that type of site continues to evolve over time, eventually there will be very little left. Malapa is an example of that. The Malapa site where I also work is, um, I don't work at Dremel or Sturkfontein. This is the site where I do work, Malapa. Um, this is the valley that Malapa is in. And the valley setting matters to this because the valley has a high rate of erosion down the valley. This is at the north end of this area of Dolomites, which is where they, the, the water flow drains ultimately into the Crocodile River and goes then to the Indian Ocean. Um, and so there's a high rate of incision of the river in this area, and the erosion rate on the sides of this are, are very high. The Malapa site itself is this. This is the site. The little pipe that you see standing there is uh, for the theodolite, is for the total station, for the excavation work. So you can see it's a pit. It's approximately two meters, maybe three meters in diameter. The walls of the pit are composed of a fossil bearing breccia that includes the two almost complete skeletons of two hominins. It was absolute fortuitous chance that Lee Berger, uh, my collaborator, had identified sites like this because from um, overhead imagery, it was clear that areas that had lots of tree growth in this landscape usually have underground cave topography that's collecting water. And he was exploring each of them. And his son, this is kind of a famous story, Matthew, at that time 10 years old, um, found a, a bone, took it, and it was, it was clearly a hominin clavicle, and that began the investigation of the site. But that clavicle was found in a blasted rock. This site, the hole here, was only blasted a few times, but it was blasted. And the breccia that was blasted by dynamite is many meters away. <laughs> and so working out where the fossil came from in the site was really not very easy. 
Today, do, yeah. Do they expect, or you, you're working there? Yeah, I'm working there, yeah. Do you expect to find more Sediba? Yes. We know that there are more Sediba fossils in the site. Yes. Um, but I'll, I'll show you what's in the site. So today, the site looks like this. Um, in 2014, a tourism structure was built there so that uh, tourists can visit and can actually, you can see this is above the ground surface and is um, held up by legs that go outside the cave deposit perimeter and is actually movable. So if the excavation changes in the future, this can be relocated to some degree. Um, I can tell you guys that a few years ago, maybe two years ago, three years ago, a newspaper ran a story that said that an alien structure had been found in South Africa. <laughs> and it was this that someone had found on an aerial photo. And they said, this has no explanation. Because it is in the middle of nowhere, I have to say. It's in the middle of a, of a 10,000 hectare nature reserve. So it's, um, it doesn't look like it belongs. But today, tourists can walk around the, the walkway above the site. Um, if work is happening, they can be watching work happening, uh, but they can see the entire site from this. And the structure also has uh, equipment that enables the paleontologists to lift large blocks of material and transport them out of the site. The two hominin skeletons were found on the edge of that pit. And so the remaining parts of the skeletons uh, have been brought out of the site uh, mostly, but some of their skeletal material, I think, does remain in the site. To the north edge, I used to say west, east edge of the site, there is a track that was originally the miners' track. The miners did their work with, with mules and sledges. So these are not wheels, but uh, runners. And the mules would drag the sledges. And so whenever they were going across the landscape, they would have to fill in. And it looks like the blasting that they did at this site in Malapa was aimed toward filling the hole where their sledges were going. And so they paved it in a way. They, they filled it with loose rubble and then continued on up the slope to, to exploit other caves. As a result, um, our team excavated the road and identified breccia blocks that were in the road that had hominin fossils in them. So this is a road that is literally paved with hominin fossils. Um, so there are these skeletons here. There was blasting. There are pieces of rock everywhere. The geological profile of the site um, has two remaining large breccia deposits. Um, the pit one is the larger one with the hominin fossils that's on the right. And pit two um, is a smaller pit. And this pit also has hominin fossils exposed. We do not think that these are Sediba um, because we think that they're later. Um, it's possible that they are uh, some form of homo, um, but we have not excavated in that area yet. There are also some stone tools in that area. But when we're working on brecciated sites, these are blocks of rock that have fossils in them. That at, the, at this photograph, they were staged so that they could be taken to the university and assessed. Many of these were first sand, scanned in a CT scanner um, as part of, uh, of Jackie Smilg's PhD work. Um, but some of them were not. They, we can identify fossils on the surface of them in many cases. And those are then given to fossil preparators whose job is to, with a microscope, remove the rock from fossil. Many of you are familiar with paleontology, where you have people who are using pneumatic tools to remove rock from fossils, we have a team of preparators. I think today that there are seven or eight preparators who are full-time, whose job is to remove rock from fossils. And the university has many others associated with other projects. So 
the, the real work of paleontology is people with great anatomical skill sets and precision who are able to remove the rock from the fossils and enable them to be studied. So all of this is very, very work intensive. When I talk about people digging in the decalcified deposits, this is what they're avoiding um, because this is very work intensive and, and expensive. Um, it has amazing results in some cases, but you cannot do this with every rock. <laughs> you just can't. And this is the MH1 skull in the middle of preparation, right? Today it's been prepared a little further than this, but it's been left with rock around it. This is what is remaining of the MH1 skeleton um, in a block that has been prepared on one surface. So several of our preparators, the most important one uh, in this project, Zandili Ndaba, who spent literally more than a year of her life taking this block and exposing the bone on the surface of it. And we're going to leave it this way. Um, we can study the bone in situ and the bones that remain inside the breccia we can have taken out by synchrotron scanning now. The synchrotron at Grenoble has a large enough gantry that it can scan blocks of this size. This block is about this big. And every bone that you see here, I think there's a couple of exceptions, almost every bone you see here is part of the MH1 skeleton. It's a hominin. The construction of the skeleton is all being found. The, so the parts that have already been prepared are what today's reconstructions are based on. These parts will add, and we will know something more. Yeah, we have not studied these yet in that way. But you can see the sacrum, right? There's amazing things here. This is, we think, one individual. Yeah. Yeah. Altogether at Malapa, I think we think today that we have at least six individuals. Two of them are the skeletons. There are pieces of another six, of another four, um, different ages, different, you know, in a couple of cases, redundant with one of the skeletons. So, yeah. And other fauna from Malapa as well. It's a small fossil deposit, but it has other articulated faunal remains. There's an articulated um, bovid that's there. There's a partially articulated hyena. There's a fox which is a really cool fossil. One of the, the, it's, a, it's a holotype of a new fox species. Um, and you can see the kind of preservation of these. This is wonderful. I'm working in a number of sites that have deposits like this, where you're like, here's the fossils. Show me the hominins. <laughs> but, but this is what you see, right? You're working on, on the surface of blocks. Yeah. At Malapa in this deposit, no. Yeah, there is a second deposit at Malapa that has also hominin material and some stone tools are visible. Yes, yeah. Um, in that case, I think possibly something Middle Stone Age. Yeah, I, this is a later fossil deposit, I think. At Sturkfontein, the member five deposit is full of Oldowan. It's got Oldowan tools um, and, um, and some bone tools. Dremelin has bone tools also. Dremelin is a great site for bone tools. Some of you know these bone tools from South Africa that are pointed bone that has been worked on the end, probably in the course of, of digging or punching into termite mounds. And the, the wear on these is very diagnostic. It's scratched in very parallel ways. So you know that they were digging in this way. How old are um, The oldest ones now are from, I think, Swartkron's member one. And those are older than 2 million, I think 2.1 million. And those were the ones that uh, Raymond Dart Those were not the ones that Raymond Dart recognized, yes. These were first recognized by Robert Broom. And, or, no, uh, excuse me, not Robert Broom. These were first recognized by Bob Brain, who began work at Swartkrons. And Brain's 
starting in the 1960s into the 1970s, his big emphasis was Dart's wrong. <laughs> Dart is talking nonsense. Now, many of you know Dart's ideas because they were the basis of the first scene of 2001, A Space Odyssey, with the apes who are like hitting each other with the bones and everything. And this was very famous. This was really the basis of the idea of the killer ape. And it was all Dart. It was Dart's idea. And Brain was like, that's not right. These are not artifacts. These are just unmodified bones. So Brain really undertook the study of taphonomy and became a, the really innovator in Paleolithic taph taphonomy to understand how bones break without humans. <laughs> if, how bones break just naturally in sites. And what does a natural sort of bone assemblage look like? Brain ruled out most of the things as tools. But he had these bones at, at Swarkrons that were pointed. They had like clearly rounded ends. And if you looked at them under a microscope, they had striations on them. These were tools. And those tools are quite common in South African sites. Dremelin, Crumb Dry, um, at uh, Sturkfontein, at Swarkrons, um, there's these tools. So it's a very distinctive tradition. They are contemporary with Older One in these places. There are too many questions because if there are tools, mm -hmm. then those companies were not framed. Or maybe they were this was Brain's big point, right? Brain, Brain's book was titled Hunters Are Hunted, right? That's a famous one. And Brain's idea was that these tools are fundamentally vegetarian tools. They were tools for getting the ants for, you know, for in Brain's point of view, they were not the ant tools. Brain thought that they were for digging tubers. And uh, the, the idea of termites or ants came in with um, Francesco Derrico and, um, and Lucinda Backwell, who did an analysis of these in the early 2000s, 2001 or two. Yeah. So that's, that's where we stand with those. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how many animal species do they live with? In, the same a more in some cases, in some cases, the question is, do we know what other animal species were, were existing or they lived with? And we know a lot about that and not everything about it. We're still finding new species, new faunal species at these sites. I mentioned this fox species at Malapa. We're still finding new things. Um, the, we know a lot about it. We know about the bovids and the pigs and the other creatures on their landscape. We also know about the carnivores. Uh, these hominids lived at the same time as saber-toothed cats called Dinophilus um, and, and Meganterion, two kinds of saber-toothed cats. Uh, they lived with early pr uh, precursors of today's lions. Um, so, you know, and hyenas, some really, some really bad hyenas. Like really like Dino, you know, what's the name of that one? I won't remember off the top of my head. There's a great big hyena there as well. Um, so we know a good bit, but the challenge is in this landscape, we don't know whether they were using microhabitats, the extent to which caves were actually important to them, or whether mostly the hominins were left you know, in caves by, other carniv by carnivores or by, um, or by chance. Um, those are things that, to be honest, I think the answer is different for different caves. If we look at hominins in all the cave sites, some of them, like Littlefoot, absolutely fell in. There was a hole, he fell in it. Um, this is also, we think, probably true of MH1. The MH1 skeleton has got perimortem fractures and his humerus and parts of his legs. Um, he fell into this site and got hurt falling. With some others, Swartkrons is an example, you've got burned bone in member one, three of Swartkron. So you know that hominins were using the site. Um, we don't know for sure which hominins. And in that site, maybe Paranthropus, we know Paranthropus is there, maybe Homo is also there as well. This is a little later in time. 
um, at Dremolin. There's possibly two, there are definitely two different hominins represented at the site, Homo and Paranthropus. There's possibly three, because Sediba is also on the landscape at the same time. So it's complex. Here's a simple site. Dimenisi is simple. I love Dimenisi. Simple site. I have um, been fortunate to visit and spend a little time at Dimenisi, and I, I really appreciated it because I got a really good understanding of what the deposition of the site was like. Dimenisi is, you know, has a landmark because of this medieval church that is there. Um, it sits on a promontory of of rock, a hill. Um, that is defined by very deep gorges on both sides. And that has been true since the time that the Dimenisi hominins were there. So these gorges are not new. They existed then. The, that means that everything on top of this promontory that is not naturally there was carried there by a hominin. And that's amazing for interpreting the archaeological record there, because you find a rock that doesn't belong there, you know that a hominin took it there. It did not get there in other, any other way. The hard top of this um, that the gorge has cut through is a lava deposit. And I've been really fortunate the last few days to learn a lot about lava deposits here in the Valley of Mexico. And this is a lava deposit, and the irregular surface of this lava deposit included some tubes and, and places where, where carnivores had dens, and in these deposits are hominin fossils. There were the remains of at least five individuals so far in this area of the site. So this is to, a view not today, but this is what the site looks like today with a permanent covering over it, with an excavation area that is you know, sort of pushing into these lava tubes, and they continue to work uh, every year. It's an irregular surface in the same way that the South African sites are irregular surfaces, but what's different is that the deposits were formed in this. So you're digging here, yeah, you have to work around the lava, but the lava didn't cover the fossils. The fossils were deposited after the lava. So you have some understanding of their situation. You also have a very strong ability to date this. So we know that the fossil hominins here are around about 1.85 million years from that deposition. Here's an example of one of the skulls. This is skull 5, uh, D4500, in the site uh, after it's, it's exposed. Um, here's another of the skulls, um, 2700. So, Dimenisi, it's a marvelously simple site, right? It was found when people were doing excavations of, of the medieval well, right? The, the, they, were, they were actually investigating medieval things, and they found this ancient fossil deposit, and that became very interesting. Um, it's a wonderfully productive site. It's, it's really one of my favorites in terms of the fossil evidences there, but it's also pretty delimited. Right? It's, it's, it's representing some limited period of time, some limited population. It's an interesting thing I'll talk about tomorrow because of the variation of the fossils. The fossils are notably variable, and that does tell us that this very small time period had something interesting biologically about it. So that's my transition from, open air site, from, from cave sites to open air sites. Here's a really famous open air site, Sangaran. Sangaran um, is in the center of Java, um, and it is a geological dome. Geological dome. You can see that there's all these white, these sort of mountainous areas here, which are everywhere around, are volcanoes. And uh, Sangaran there is today in a valley that's separating volcanoes. Why is there a valley there? There's a valley there, ironically, because the geology pushed upwards. The pushing upwards of the geology, and the very bottom of this slide, and I, I see that this is underneath the, um, 
underneath the table for some of you, so I'm just going to describe it. What it's showing is rock layers that are doing this, and then underlying rock layers are exposed in the center of it. So when rocks push upwards and make this dome, it creates an erosion potential on its sides, and erosion is happening, and if it then cuts through something hard and ends up in a softer sort of deposit underneath, it makes a bowl. And that's what's happened with Sangaran. This has gone up, and then it's eroded a bowl shape in the middle. And the river actually cuts through that because it's the easiest place to erode. That has exposed layers of sediment that fossils were deposited in in the last two million years. So two million years ago, this is a swampy area at the side of Java, which is rising somewhat out of the ocean as Australia is pushing upwards into Asia, right? So Java is sort of forming as a geological sort of uplift. And the swamp gets to rise up like this. As ash is laid down, as sand is laid down with, with rivers, it's this sort of big inter, big succession. Here's the sediments. Big succession of volcanic layers and sedimentary layers that have formed on a flat and then have raised up, and now they're eroding out. So this is a very localized feature. It exists here in this part of Java. We know that there's lots and lots of fossils from this part of Java, and it's because of the exposure of these ancient sediments. It's, it's totally the exposure that's created this potential. Um, today, this area, which, just go back to the geology slide, um, there you've got a kilometer scale on the bottom, so this covers an area of about seven kilometers by about maybe 20 kilometers. That area is occupied by around 200,000 people. So it's, it's not a city, it's actually quite rural, here's the look of it, but there's a lot of people living there. And those people are all small farmers, and in their backyards and in their fields are fossils. Fossils of mastodons, fossils of ancient carnivores, and fossils of hominins. The fossils were first recognized there by, uh, by Ralph von Koningswald in the 1930s. And Homo erectus, right? It was come from this region, and it was the Dutch colonial administration and the Dutch geological survey that was pushing field exploration there. Today, research is very active. Um, there's a museum on the site, and the Indonesian uh, archaeological uh, community is super engaged there. And field work still happens. Here you see what, an excavation that is one of those that I hate, right? It's the kind that you just are like, really, guys? I think, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe step that a little bit. Um, but. Uh, it is a productive place for both archaeology and for artifacts uh, and for fossils. But what is most important today is that the archaeologists and government have put into place a very good system for people who find fossils in their property to report them um, so that they're not entering the black market and to the extent that historically they did. Many of you may know a fossil from another place in Indonesia, uh, Sangmu Makan, which is nearby here, um, was found in New York City. And it was discovered in a shop where someone had sold it to a collector, and the collector was trying to you know, market it. And the owner of the shop recognized that this is not just some fossil. This is a Homo erectus skull. And contacted the American Museum and, and worked it out so that this skull was repatriated to Indonesia and studied. So, this is our interaction with, you know, sort of the public. Okay, the, I think the last one, maybe this is, no, the next to the last one. Old Dubai Gorge, super, super famous site. And it is maybe most people's model of what a paleontological, paleoanthropological site will be. Um, Here's the look of it today. It's got this really famous sort of monolith of, of remaining rock, and then the, the areas that 
have been eroded. Um, recently, uh, the Stone Age Institute, uh, Nicholas Toth and Kathy Schick and their collaborators uh, funded the erection of a, of a really monument with Zinjanthropus and Homo habilis there. This is the satellite view, right? So there's a main gorge and then there's a side gorge and what they're cutting through is the area that was once the a ancient lake and the edge of a lake. And so there are, um, there are deposits that are lake deposits in some areas, areas that are uh, lake shore deposits and many stream and river deposits that were flowing into the lake at that time. Um, from um, one point, or from probably much older in time, but the deposits that, that are there now represent uh, times from around uh, 1.9, 2.0 million years up until the middle Pleistocene and even some of the late Pleistocene. It's very famous for the work of Richard and Mary Leakey, and there's lots of historical documentation there. The geology is well understood, and in some ways is simple, in some ways is difficult. Bed one, bed two, bed three, bed four. This is a great image that shows all of these, and the later Masek and then Dutu beds. Um, you can see that there's faulting, and it's possible to work out you know, where things are relative to each other. Today, the chronology of some of these transitions is well known, the bed one, bed two transition, for instance, um, because there's a lava that covers bed one. But the transition from bed three to bed four, and also in some parts of the bed two to bed three, are less clear because at some stages, these surfaces, which were surfaces, eroded before the deposition of later material. So you have the buildup of sediment, and then you have removal of sediment, and then you have buildup of more sediment. So there are discontinuities in the deposit. Those are part of the complexity of understanding the entire thing. Some excavations at Old Divai, I'm going to show you FLK North, are extremely large. There's a lot of rock that's been moved from some of these. And, and a lot of the Old Divai excavation is rock. Um, some of them are much more localized. Um, so the DK site, which was one of Mary Leakey's site, um, is a site where one of the Habilis skulls was found. And this site, Mary found this sort of circle of lava rocks and interpreted this as a micro, uh, a, a, as an actual living floor. It's a place where the fossil hominins were interacting, were existing. Today, this is more often uh, described in geological terms. Maybe this is a place where there was a tree and the rock has this form because of other factors besides the hominins. In other words, the interpretation of remains from sites of this kind isn't just evident from what you're digging. You have to understand the site formation process and how those might have interacted with the artifacts that you find. What do I have next? Melka Kunture in Ethiopia. This is in the news over the last maybe month or two because of the redating of one of the Melka Kunture sites, Garba 4. Um, Melka Kunture, you can see it there on the map of Ethiopia, is just south of Addis Ababa. And it is an erosive surface that's been formed by the Awash River and its upper extent. So you have a river that's passed through here. It exposes things along different parts of it, and those different parts represent different deposits of sediment at different times. Old Dubai is the same. When we're finding, when you're hearing about things at Old Dubai, it's some sites are 1.9 million, and some sites are you know, 800,000, and some sites are different times, different species, different hominins in one big area. Um, here, created by the erosive system of the Awash River. The landscape around it is beautiful savanna-like landscape. I've been fortunate to visit this site, and it's in the news now because of this little jawbone of this hominin. The jawbone is not new. This was found in the early 1980s. Um, but the dating is new, 
and it's now thought to be 2.05 million years or older. So this could actually now be the oldest Homo erectus. Um, in this case, um, in this case, it is surrounding sediment. Um, but I think I have to think through. Yeah, I think it's just redating of an ash. I think that's what it was. Here's the actual site, right? This is, and this is not a huge site. When we talk about excavations, sometimes they're giant, like that. FLK North site was. Sometimes they're very localized. And the localized sites, at uh, Gombori 2, there are these footprint sites. And you can see why people excavate the sites they excavate. Why do you excavate a giant thing? Because you know that you're going to encounter something else on a surface. Right? You find a paleo surface. You want to see what's next. These footprints. I've got footprints. They seem to be, in, in, this, in the case of Gombori, I believe this story is correct. I, it, don't quote me on it, YouTube. Um, but I believe these were footprints that were recognized in a profile, where you had cut a, an archaeological profile, and you see that there are these little like dips in sediment. Once upon a time, those weren't really recognized for what they are. What they are is footprints in ancient surfaces. And if you dig across, so you've got in your profile, this sort of shape. If you dig across and expose that surface, you expose the footprints. And that's something for, you know, to put some effort into. So we can understand a lot about behavior from footprints. At uh, Gombori 2, they have series of footprints from different time intervals. And this is also true at a place uh, on the east side of Lake Turkana called Ilaret, where there are many footprint trails that are 1.4 or 1.5 million years old. Last site, Shangchen, China. And I've been sort of going from extremes. I went from underground to stages of erosion of caves deposits to a deposit that's like a cave deposit that had formed on the surface to surface geology that's formed by water principally. This one is a loess site. It's a gigantic, and you can see here in the landscape, these big exposures of red soil. This is loess that was blown, is windblown soil. So in China, central China, it's like actually my home state of Kansas. We have these enormous loess deposits that formed when the glaciations, which covered large parts of Eurasia and North America, the glaciers are there. <coughs> The glaciers are there. So the glaciers are gone. For some period of time, there is enormous areas of denuded landscape, and the wind just carries stuff south. And in North America, you guys know that there is the in Nebraska the sand hills, these enormous sand dunes that were formed at the end of the Pleistocene, and today are a unique habitat. In my part, it's not sand because that fell faster. It's low S. It's, it's fine particle um, clay silt. And it forms enormous deposits. And you see uh, creeks in my neck of the woods cutting through these in China also. So exploration of some of these ancient deposits. Uh, Shangjian is here in central China. Here's sort of site profiles. And people working found stone tools. Shangchen is an interesting site because it dates to as old as 2, 2.1 million. So this may be the oldest archaeological site in Eurasia. There's a couple that might be older, um, but Shangchen, some people like as the oldest site. Excavating in these, if you find something eroding out of that steep slope, you try to figure out where it came from and you dig. And sometimes you find more stuff. But it's an enormous deposit, which is not very rich in fossil material, right? I'm not showing you fossils. I'm showing you they're stone tools. Um, and that's sort of the other end of the extreme. So the contexts of different sites help to determine what you can find in them. 
in this time frame, the evidence for early HOMO, we work in every context from underground sites where we're digging holes in underground dirt to hardened brecciated sites where we are employing people to meticulously remove fossils from surrounding rock to outdoor sites where the fossils are in rock and paleontologists are jackhammering through it to get the layers removed so that they can work along a layer to sediment sites that are easy to work that have been exposed um, but are enormous and colossal compared to the con contents to sites that are blown by wind and the hominins are on a landscape that the wind is forming okay all right questions yeah please well, the question is, what hominin is making these tools at Shangchen? And the answer is, that is a very interesting question. Um, we're not sure. I think that most anthropologists would assume that this is going to be Homo erectus, that this is the initial departure of hominins from Africa. By 2.1 million, it's older than any Homo erectus in Africa. And that raises the question of whether there is an earlier species that has, you know, some occupation of parts of Eurasia, or whether erectus originated in Asia and moved to Africa, um, originated presumably from an earlier form of hominin, but, you know, that's the... Uh, it, it doesn't have to be Africa out all the time. Sometimes it could be Africa in, or Eurasia into Africa. Um, or unknown, right? So that is really the, all of the earliest archaeological sites in, in Eurasia have no fossil hominin material with them. The first with fossil hominins is Dimenisi, the 1.8, 1.85 million years. Other questions? Um, yeah. In the mountain, as each other? Um, let's hold that question for tomorrow when I'm going to show you those fossils. <laughs> yeah? Because it's a deep question. I don't think it's a hard question. I think that they're, you know, the context convinces me that they're the same thing. They don't look like, you know, they don't look like, um, my assessment of them is that while there are some variations among them, the variations are not patterned in a very systematic way, right? It's, we look at these and we say, well, they look variable, they look different, but it's not that they form two groups that are very diagnos diagnosable, right? Most anthropologists who think that there are two species there think that one skull is one of them and the rest are the other. And that becomes hard to test. You know, but but you'll see, right? The the anatomy, there's some defense for that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's one thing uh, not missing here, but mm -hmm. uh, what about the ecology? Yeah, yeah. What, what we may be seeing is just adaptation mm -hmm. from the hominin mm -hmm. and Order of that, we are looking at an enormous mm -hmm. uh, variation mm -hmm. and diversification, but it may be just an artifact yes. of the different landscapes. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to the not just Africa or Eurasia, mm -hmm. this problem is much more complex. Yes. Right? So the question is what about ecology? You know, there's going to be some difference in adaptation, maybe between hominins. But that should depend on the ecology that they're in, the environment they experience, the habitat that they prefer. And in Eurasia, that might be, you know, very complicated relative to where, you know, they might have originated in Africa. Um, and the answer is, what we know about ecology always comes from the site and the, and the constraints of the site. In some East African contexts today, people can do a lot of ecological work on the soils that have formed in the site. They can do carbonate, 
you know, assessment in, in soils so they can figure out the, the plant coverage. Sometimes they find root fossils and they can identify from the roots what types of species were there. Animal fossils, they can do quite a lot of work on their ecology from stable isotopes, from dental macro wear, from other kinds of considerations. In South African sites, we don't have, in many cases, the same potential of looking at soils and everything that goes with that. We don't have lake cores from ancient lakes, um, but we sometimes have fossils of these things directly. Um, at Sturkfontein, there's some amazing fossil lianas um, that show us that there were times that, and they don't occur in this area of South Africa today, so they tell us that the climate was much more warmer, probably wetter at the time that those were found. Um, seeds from plants are quite commonly found. Palynology, the study of ancient pollen, has made a lot of progress um, in those situations. And of course, the preservation of many of the animals is often much higher than in South African sites. So you have different types of information. All of us are working toward understanding if there is a big picture. South Africa, we know about what happened just outside of a cave. Sometimes we know a lot about it, right? If you look at microfauna, they're brought from a certain radius by owls into caves. And so you know that there's like, this is sampling exactly what the ecology was in that, in that radius. But it's difficult to compare that information with information from Olduvai Gorge, where you might be looking at spans of thousands of years and you know changes to the East African monsoon cycle or things like that. Um, so there's big and, and micro, and those two are hard to synthesize into a big idea. Mm -hmm. I have two more. Go for it. What about the origin of homo? Yes. Is there, because this is the, the topic of the course. Yeah, yeah. Is there a single origin? Look at this. Isn't it, isn't it incredible? I'm going to show you. Here's the origin of Homo, maybe. Right? This is the oldest fossil of Homo. Um, Ledi Gararu in Ethiopia, approximately 2.8 million years. I don't love this fossil. Look, Brian Vilmore is a, is a great scientist, and the work that they've done to to characterize Leti Gararu and this fossil and the later deposits of Leti Gararu who have amazing uh, archaeological material in the 2.5, 2.6 million year old range. Um, this fossil is not my favorite one to try to diagnose, right, in terms of what is homo. Um, it is similar to Australopithecus africanus in a lot of ways. It's similar to Australopithecus sediba, actually, in some really interesting ways. And the comparisons of this fossil um, emphasize that the jawbone, the corpus of the jaw, is parallel, top and bottom. It's actually a little curved on the bottom, which is found in many of the earliest homo, homo habilis mandibles. Um, the position of the mental foramen is, is, and the ascending ramus is like other fossils of Homo, not very much like most Africanus fossils. So the traits that are here that are, that are interesting and diagnostic, I think there's a good argument that this is Homo. If so, Homo existed in Ethiopia by 2.8 million years. This tooth uh, 2.6 million years um, from, Nachi, from the Nachikui formation um, at, on the west side of Lake Turkana may be the earliest homo. Um, it's, like I said, 2.5 million years or so, and, um, and it's a tooth. It is in an archaeological site. It does have artifacts associated with it in the same sort of situation. Here's an uh, upper jaw, a maxilla, uh, on the left, on the right is one you've already seen today. That is uh, Australopithecus afarensis, afarensis. This one is also from Hadar, but this is 2.33 million years old. Um, and as you can see, it's wider. Its tooth rows are more rounded. 
Uh, the anterior teeth are not projecting nearly as much. From the side, you can see that the maxilla is taller before the nose, and the incisive foramen and incisive canal that, that are dividing the maxilla front and back is much more uh, vertically oriented and not as horizontally oriented. That fossil, uh, Bill Kimball described in 1997 as the earliest homo. This fossil from Uraha in Malawi, 2.3 million years, more or less, um, it's similar in some ways to a later mandible uh, called ER-1802 that at that time was in the late 1990s was called Homo rudolfensis. And so this one got called early Homo, could be the earliest Homo. Temporal bone from Shemaran in Kenya, which is in the Tujin Hills area of Kenya, um, 2.3 million years. The temporal bone of Paranthropus is highly pneumatized and protrudes outwards, and the, and the brain size is smaller. So this sort of, the, the wall of the skull is more medial. In Homo, the brain is bigger, and so the wall is more lateral. And so there's an argument based on the morphology of this that this is Homo. 2.03, we've got this dentition. This dentition is Homo. This is, the, this is the one where I look at it and I say, that's Homo. That does not look like any kind of Australopithecus. The third molar is smaller than the second. Um, the incisors and canines are, are very Homo-like. The third premolar, it doesn't look like an Australopithecus third premolar. So this one I'm happy with. This one's same age, 1470. It's not Australopithecus. There is our evidence for the origin of Homo. I just gave it to you in three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> the earliest evidence that we have is all in the east side. Right? I haven't named a South African fossil. I haven't named a Eurasian fossil. And, um, and in fact, in South Africa, we today have a pretty good degree of evidence about sites like Cromdry, Dremolin, um, and Swartkrons that have abundant Paranthropus fossils, Paranthropus robustus, and also Homo fossils. But in none of those sites are any of the Homo fossils older than two million years. So they have Paranthropus fossils from earlier, not Homo fossils. That could just be chance at this moment, but it, I think, is maybe an indication. It's a trend, it's a trend. yeah. Um, Sturkfontein member five, parts of which might be as old as 2.2, 2.3 million, has Oldowan and has some fossils of, of early Homo. But those fossils are probably from a later part of member five. So I don't, there's no good evidence in South Africa of Homo before two million years. Um, and when it shows up, the first really good evidence is absolutely erectus-like. Looks like a little erectus. So here's the thing. These fossils that I've shown you, none of them are erectus. That's also clear. They, to some degree, some of them resemble later fossils that are habilis. Uh, the, the Hadar example is, is one of those. Looks a little bit like later habilis jaws, like uh, OH13, for instance. This one, Richard Leakey found it. He said, this is Homo habilis, and since then it's been renamed Homo rudolfensis, is what many people call it now. Um, but why is it Homo? It's Homo because it has a big brain. This brain is 750 cubic centimeters. Um, none of the rest of them have skulls, right? So you don't know how big their brains are. Um, this one is Homo because of its teeth. 1470 doesn't have teeth, but the roots of the teeth are there, and the roots of the teeth don't look like these teeth. They are big molars and, and big premolar teeth. We have it, in other words, the Uraha example, got called Homo because of um, its resemblance to ER-1802. 
ER-1802 has got big teeth. And people were calling it Rudolfensis because they thought well, those big teeth should go with 1470's big teeth. Ah, it's a homo, but it's not habilis. It goes with this other big tooth thing. Um, but today we've got other fossil remains that will... Maybe I should buzz to them now. Do you want to ask another question? Yes. I'll, yes. Uh, about the Chinese then again. Yes, yes. Uh, which lithic industry are they? They're very simple flake tools. I would call them older one, but in China they call them chopper chopping or something like that. Yeah. No, because I think, I mean, that's another important thing. Yeah, absolutely. We don't find yeah. a Cholean. And this is, a, this is also interesting today because Acheulean exists at Melka Kunture by 1.9 million. So you have very early Acheulean. You don't have early Acheulean everywhere. Right? It, Acheulean is... Yeah, that's, yeah. And that's interesting also because when you say that it could be also Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, in terms of morphology, there are many chances of that. But the yeah. culture... Yeah. No, it seems like in, in Africa, mm -hmm. it was where that became more uh, complex yes. kind of industry. The directionality used to seem like it was simple in Africa and only existed in Africa first. Mm -hmm. And then, at some later time, and, and those early Oldowan people were the first to move to Eurasia, Dimenisi. And then, sometime later, Acheulean emerged in Africa and coexisted with Old Juan and, and continue, they both continued on. But Acheulean never actually got very far, except India. <laughs> it never got to China. It never got to Indonesia. It did get to India. But, exactly. Today, the first Acheulean is earlier than any evidence of hominin, any, any hominin fossils outside of Africa, but not earlier than the earliest archaeology outside of Africa. So this creates a question about the order of events. In the absence of data, <laughs> in the absence of data, what do you say, right? Yes. Yes, that's a great question. What do I think about tools made of bamboo or other perishable materials, right? Wood. Wood, for example, yes. I think any hominin that can make a flake can make something else sharp. And a lot of the time, what you want is something else that's sharp. You don't necessarily want a stone flake. Now, stone flakes have a utility. They cut through um, skin much more effectively than a wooden sharpened wood does. Um, they can disarticulate, you know, sort of joints much more effectively. And with a hand axe, a lot of time you think, okay, what are you going to use a big artifact like this for? You're going to use it either for cutting wood or you're going to use it for large sort of tasks um, where a wooden or a sharpened artifact like bamboo wouldn't be as suitable. Um, but I think that the predominant technology of all of these hominins was always perishable, mm -hmm. right? The, the stone was an exception. You don't want to use stone if you don't have to. First of all, it's heavy, and you've got to carry it from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the shells, the shells as well. Shell tools in, in Indonesia, in some of the early Sangaran sites, are very interesting, very important. Um, uh, I know an archaeologist, Kildo Choi, who did some work on that, on the early shell tools. And yeah, shells, even things like shark teeth, you know, are possible tools. Um, and if you're in an ecology that provides those things, maybe carrying a large chunk of stone from somewhere is not what you're likely to do. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Thank you, John. Yeah. I think for today. I think that's good. I think this is great. Yeah. And tomorrow, I think you already have some. 
pictures we can look at. <laughs> so thank you, John. This Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes.